You know, when we lose real history in human standards, we lose the real idea of sin, S-I-N. That's an interesting word that means missing the mark. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembert. And I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV, where we have learned and continue learning the Word of God. It is fascinating as we go through the scripture. Corey is here to help us. Corey, what's going on? Well, I'm going to be looking into our future a little bit. I'm going to be focusing on Judges chapter four uh, and the Judge Deborah. Ryan, what about you? Well, today I'm talking about idols and why it's foolish to worship them. All right, very good. That is excellent. And Janice, what did you do today? Going to talk about following Jesus. All right, very good. That is an excellent one. Now, remember, open up your Bible guide, but the most important book of all is the Bible, the Word of God. That is the 66 books written by the 40 authors. Let's open it up and listen to what God has said. Judges 3, verses 1 through 11. Now these are the nations which the Lord left, that he might test Israel by them, that is, all who had not known any of the wars in Canaan. This was only so that the generations of the children of Israel might be taught to know war, at least those who had not formerly known it. Namely, five lords of the Philistines, all the Canaanites, the Sidonians and the Hivites who dwelt in Mount Lebanon, from Mount Baal Hermon to the entrance of Hamath. And they were left that he might test Israel by them to know whether they would obey the commandments of the Lord, which he had commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. Thus the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And they took their daughters to be their wives, and gave their daughters to their sons, and they served their gods. So the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God, and served the Baals and the Asherahs. Therefore the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia. And the children of Israel served Cushan Rishathaim eight years. When the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the children of Israel who delivered them, Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel. He went out to war, and the Lord delivered Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand. And his hand prevailed over Cushan Rishathaim. So the land had rest for forty years. Then Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. Judges chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. Today we begin a new book. This is really exciting. And as we look at it, we go to the Hebrew words. The Hebrew title, Shafetim, means judges and can also mean governors or can mean rulers. I believe that there were a total of 13 of those moral rulers in the book of Judges. And the book of Judges highlights those 13. Samuel was not born a Levite, but an Ephraimite. Yet he ended up in the tent tabernacle with the duties of a Levite. I consider him to be the 13th judge of Israel. It was also Samuel who anointed King Saul, which was a mistake that the elders of Israel made. And Samuel told them that they got the king that they wanted. Samuel also anointed David, who became the king after Saul. And finally, finally, after he failed. Most biblical scholars read the book of Judges as a political book before the kings. Many people simply read it as a book of couching heroes. But I like to read this book as Israel's record of descent into darkness before God. In other words, it's about the people of God falling into sin over and over again. And God's responses to them in that sin. Now, I know that the Bible is supposed to be a book of encouragement, and it is. 
and the Bible speaks to us, and it does, but this is something that is really interesting because a lot of people talk about, well, the Bible, you know, it's so violent, it does this and it says that and hits people and tears people down. And well, Wait a minute. The Bible is not a book about making you feel good, but the Bible is a book about truth. It's a book about the truth of human nature and the truth of God's nature, beloved. And so we need to understand that. If you have your Bible guide, turn to today's passage. If you don't, did you know that you can get a Bible guide simply by writing to us or calling us? Another way to do this is a fast way. It's go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com. Click on the page of the Bible guide. It'll take you to a donate page. And let me just say that uh, we want to thank you for your donations. They have kept us alive. That's how we survive. So thank you so much for them. We don't give the amounts. We let the Lord speak to you because we trust the Lord. And so uh, that's our only source of income. So thank you so much for doing that. And uh, it's a real witness too, to see people who are interested in the Bible. Now today, as we focus on this, we look at the ways we learn. <laughs> and this, I mean, Judges chapter three, verses one through 11. Oh yeah, we're learning. And it's not nice necessarily. Father, I pray today that you would help us to learn what in the world is going on and help us to see the truth because a lot of this applies right now, today in our governments around the world. In Jesus' name, and we said together, amen, Lord, make it so. Now, the scripture tells us in Judges chapter 3, verse 1. Now, these are the nations which the Lord left that he might test Israel by them. Notice that. These are the nations the Lord left that he might test Israel by them. That is, all who had not known any of the wars in Canaan. This was only so that the generation of the children of Israel might be taught to know war at least those who had not formally known it. Old Testament times, very interesting. Verse three, namely five lords of the Philistines, all the Canaanites, the Sidonians, and the Hivites who dwelt in Mount Lebanon and from Mount Baal, the Hermon, uh, to the entrance of Hamath. And they were left that he might test Israel by them to know whether they would obey the commandments of the Lord which he had commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. The Bible tells us when we lose the real history of the human race, we lose the reality of sin. I want to say that again. Leave it up on the screen because this is really important right now. When we lose the real history of the human race, real history of the human race, we lose the reality of sin, S-I-N. You see, when you turn away from sin and aim for Jesus, he helps you. The idea is for us to not make excuses for sin. Well, yeah, I did this, but I'm human. It's okay, I'm only human. Hold on a minute. That's right, and that's exactly what Jesus did. He came to earth, lived a human life. He was fully God and fully human. And he passed away. Three days later, he rose from the dead in the flesh as God. Stayed with us, seen by over 500 men, then ascended to God. Now that's interesting because Jesus Christ paid the cost of sin and he overcame sin. So he can help us to conquer sin through Jesus Christ. Judges chapter three, five, and six. Thus the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And they took their daughters to be their wives and gave their daughters to the sons and their, they served their gods. Now that is stunning. You see, beloved, the decline of man continues. The decline of man continues. If the Lord is not active in our lives, if the Lord is not active in our lives, God makes ways for us to live with him and to grow, to confront sin and identify with God for his help. God makes ways for us to identify with him for his help. He, he says, I want you to be holy. I want you to be different. 
I don't want you just to go through your life, get up this day and see what you can do. I want you to be different. Now, keep that in mind because as Christians, we're living a life that is responsible to God by being responsible to each other. Now, these last verses. So the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Ashtoras, or Ash, Asherahs. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he sold them into the hand of Cushan Rehatham, king of Mesopotamia, at the children of Israel, served Cushan Rehatham eight years. And when the children of Israel cried to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the children of Israel who delivered them. Othiniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, the spirit of the Lord came upon him and he judged Israel. He went out to war and the Lord delivered Cushan Rathiam, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand. And his hand prevailed over Cushan Rathiam so that the land had rest for 40 years. And then Othaniel, son of Kenaz, died. Now, this is amazing. See, sometimes God's ways seem unusual when we come to him for help. But when we recognize him, and we do his commands, he is always there to help and to heal us, beloved. Did you notice that he said he became a judge of Israel? And he started with Israel, judge them, make sure they understand who God is. And when they did, suddenly God gave them victory. God doesn't give us victory until we learn who he is. So today we pray, Lord, help me in understanding sin and to overcome it through Jesus Christ. Well, it's time now to carry on with our Bible study. And you know, today we begin the book of Judges and we read all about Israel's failure to complete their conquest of Canaan, the death of Joshua and Israel's unfaithfulness to the Lord. You know, this era of Israelite history wasn't good. Unfortunately, after Joshua and all that generation who witnessed the great works of the Lord, they passed away and the new generation of people turned to the worship of false gods. And you know, we all know God's opinion on this. And to emphasize the foolishness of these practices, I thought it would be really worth seeing how these ancient idols were made. As God repeatedly declares in his word, they're nothing but metal, wood, and stone. Let's study. As part of the great rebellion against the creator God, man has continually sought to worship other gods, gods of metal, wood, and stone. Although these so-called gods can neither hear, nor see, nor know, nor save, Man, in his utter defiance, has continued to fashion these worthless idols. In fact, in order to expose the delusion that these images somehow bear supernatural power, God many times in his word unmasks these idols to reveal exactly what they are. Namely, lifeless, breathless, and spiritless pieces of wood, stone, and metal fashioned by the hands of men. Indeed, as the Bible informs us, these idols were casted or molded. Although this might give the impression that all idols were made of solid metal, this was not always so. In fact, normally only some of the smaller idols would be cast entirely of metal, while most of the larger ones were first made of wood or stone and then covered with plates of metal. Thus the carpenter and metalsmith worked together. The carpenter would first take a log of wood and shape it into the desired image, and then the metalsmith would overlay it with metal plating. Isaiah 44.13 aptly describes the carpenter's process. It says the craftsman stretches out his rule, he marks out one with chalk, he fashions it with a plane, he marks it out with the compass, and makes it like the figure of a man, according to the beauty of a man, that it may remain in the house. Thus the carpenter would first trace out the image on the log of wood with chalk, and then cut and carve it into that form. 
Vivint Denon, in his work Travels in Egypt, gives a first-hand account of such an idol, which he found on one of the columns of the portico of Dendara. It was covered with stucco and painted, he writes. The stucco being partly scaled off gave me the opportunity of discovering lines traced as if with red chalk. Curiosity prompted me to take away the whole of the stucco, and I found the form of the figure sketched with corrections of the outline, a division into 22 parts, the separation of the thighs being in the middle of the whole height of the figure, and the head comprising rather less than a seventh part. This more modern idol is probably quite similar in construction to its ancient counterpart. The wooden image once made could be worshipped as it was, or it could be covered with plaster or with metal. On the other hand, the metallic outside might not always have had an interior of wood, but may sometimes have been filled with clay, as idols in India are. Clearly, these idols are not gods. They are merely the workings of man's hands, and as such are an empty and vain pursuit. And so the Lord declares, You are my witnesses. Is there a god besides me? Indeed, there is no other rock. I know not one. Now, I know that we in the West might not have any physical household idols lying around, but we do have our own idols and gods that we regularly put first before God. You know, anything that takes our attention away from God and becomes more important than God is an idol. You know, maybe it's an obsession with wealth, or maybe it's our praise and worship of a celebrity or a musician or an athlete or even ourselves. And let's face it, we live in a world today that's totally obsessed with sports, and it's actually become a god. And please understand what I'm saying. It's not wrong to watch sports. You know, I actually really enjoy them myself. But I think we can all agree that it has become a god for a lot of people. And, you know, we've got it all backwards. The very first commandment of the Ten Commandments is that you shall have no other gods before God. And the second is you shall not make for yourself an idol. So we need to remember that we as believers are servants of God first. Of course, we can enjoy things like music and sports, but we can't allow it to become our obsession. We need to be consumed with serving the all-consuming God and spreading the gospel as Jesus Christ instructed us to do in the Great Commission. Yeah, you know, that's really that's true, Ryan. I mean, to the idea of serving God, and we need to pay attention to that. That's very good. Thank you so much. Corey, what'd you do? Well, today I'm going to be taking a look at this city of Hatsor. Uh, on tomorrow's program, or tomorrow's reading in the Discovery Guide, I should say, we begin our reading in Judges chapter 4. And that's actually when this uh, story, this history of Deborah uh, comes about. And, you know, she claims responsibility uh, for leading the Israelites in taking down Hatsor, the city of Hatsor, and its king. Now, Hatsor appears in two different, uh, you know, time periods of this conquest of Canaan here with uh, Deborah and Barak, and then back in the time of Joshua as well. So let's take a look at the archaeology of Hatsor and its biblical history and see what we can learn. The ancient city of Hatsor was located just north of the Sea of Galilee. Its first mention in the Bible comes in Joshua chapter 11. Jabin, the king of Hatsor, gathered together an alliance of multiple kings and their fighting men to resist the Israelites. Hatsor was the head of a major Canaanite coalition. The Bible records Israel's utter victory over this coalition, how they chased them all the way up to Sidon area, killing all that they caught, and then how they captured the allied cities, killing their kings, but leaving the cities themselves standing. All except for Hatsor. Hatsor was captured, the king killed, and the city completely razed. The head of the enemy alliance became a signal fire. Later on in the Bible, another leader of Israel had to face an enemy in Hatsor. This time, the judge Deborah led the Israelites in battle against another Jabin, king of Hatsor, and his army commander Sisera. Once again, the Israelites were successful in defeating Hatsor. Hatsor was eventually rebuilt by King Solomon as an Israelite defensive city. A few generations later, it was captured by Assyria, and Jeremiah prophesied that it would be destroyed completely by Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Extensive archaeological work has gone on at Hatsor. Its upper tell boasts an ancient acropolis of 30 acres that from a bird's eye view looks bottle shaped. Remnants to the Israelite city of Solomon that flourished for about 200 years include fortifications, a tower, homes, a water system, and a six-chambered gate. 
Under the Israelite city was found evidence of the old Canaanite city. Some of the finds include Canaanite temples, a section of the city wall, its corresponding moat, several Egyptian statues, a monumental staircase, and a large ceremonial palace. All experts agree that this Canaanite city was destroyed and set on fire. A thick layer of ancient ash attests to it. Inside the palace, whose walls still stand six and a half feet high, the ferocity of the fire was discovered. Based off of melted clay vessels and vitrified mud bricks, that is, mud bricks that have begun to transform into glass, the current excavator has determined that the fire was twice the temperature of a regular fire, likely due to its wooden building materials and storerooms of nearly a thousand gallons of oil. The palace also yielded a few statues, a jewelry box, weapons, and a lion-shaped ceremonial drinking cup. Peculiar to this destruction of Hatsor is that the targeted areas were public and religious buildings, and that the destroyers purposefully disfigured images and statues of kings and gods. This perfectly aligns with the destruction by the Israelites, as outlined in the Bible. Most scholars align it with the destruction by Joshua, but based off of the date of about 1250 BC, this would align it well with the destruction by Deborah and Barak. So, the Bible seems to intimate that there were two dis uh, Israelite destructions of the city of Hatzor. And in the archaeological record, there are two fiery destructions of the city of Hatzor right at the time on the, the Bible's timeline. Not necessarily always the timeline that scholars attribute to the Bible, but on the Bible's actual timeline, uh, these destructions do match up to the Israelite destruction by Joshua and then the Israelite destruction by Deborah and Barak. You know, it's very interesting. And uh, as we begin again, we talked about this yesterday, to study the history of the Bible, it makes sense. Everything begins to make sense when we take a look at it. So pay attention to serving God and then study the history of the Bible to know what's going on. All right, very good. Janice? So Rod, we're still looking a little bit different. We do live in Ontario, and the day that we're taping this is January the 29th, even though this is March 3rd's program. So we are under a stay-at-home order right now, so the program does look a little bit different, but Lord willing, we won't have to record this way for much longer. We're so glad that you're joining with us on the program. Now, today we were focusing in on Judge chapter three. And I called this following Jesus because this interesting part of scripture here in Judges three, we discover that the remaining nations in the land of Canaan were there to serve as a testing ground for God's people. The Lord allowed these nations to stay in the land to enable his people to learn warfare and to see God's faithfulness firsthand and to test their commitment to serve him alone. It says in Judges 3 verse 1 that he might test Israel by them. That is all who had not known any of the wars in Canaan. This was only so that the generations of the children of Israel might be taught to know war, at least those who had not formerly known it. Going down to verse 4, and they were left that he, God, might test Israel by them to know whether they would obey the commandments of the Lord. And what that reminded me of was this New Testament example in Ephesians chapter 6, when Paul talks to us about the believer that our fight is not a physical one anymore, but it is a spiritual battle and that we must follow the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our head. He is the commander. And he gives us this wonderful word picture of the armor of God that we need to put on every day. If you're not familiar with it, I want to read it to you. It's in Ephesians chapter 6, starting at verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of the age." 
against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all power and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication um, for all the saints. We need to remember that, Rod, that we are being tested every day and for those of us who have made that commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ to follow after him, we need to apply that armor to remember to pray. These are, these are re- real spiritual things that we can apply to our lives to be strong and to follow after the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, you know, Paul, he, do, he does this. He uses the uh, armor of the soldiers, the Roman soldiers. Yes. And But the idea is the same. And the idea is to listen to God and to allow the Lord to equip you. And remember, back in the Old Testament, when David was going to take on the giant Goliath and mm-hmm. King Saul wanted him, David, to wear his armor and David tried it on and it didn't work because it wasn't his armor and he wasn't used to putting that on. The same with us. We need to do that on a daily basis and follow after the Lord Jesus Christ for his protection and his guidance in the world in which we live today. That's right. You know, Venezuela is a country that really needs help. They need the Lord right now. South America is a beautiful continent, but let me tell you something, there's trouble. And I pray, Father, for Venezuela, I pray for the Christians there. Help them to know the difference between what it means to follow Christ and what it means to do what people do. But help us, Lord, to grow in Venezuela. And so, Father, I pray today that your Holy Spirit would descend and apply on all the Christians there that they would see you and hear you.